here. This hopefully is a lot of review from intro bio. Chapters two and three in your AMP textbook are a lot of review of chemistry and the basic cell components. Um, so the nucleus here is going to, is part of the cell, right? So, um, one of the organelles, and it is, it contains these chromosomes. There's 21 pairs, I'm sorry, 23 pairs of chromosomes in humans, and each chromosome is going to be composed of DNA. DNA is actually wrapped around these other proteins called histones, um, but the key part here is that this DNA is in every single one of your cells, and it is a stable storage of genetic material. Um, the stable storage of genetic material is deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, it's made up of nucleotides. The language of our genes, um, nu nucleotides are just these polymers of nucleic acids. Knowing the term monomer and polymer will be important. So a single base, um, a single nucleotide is a monomer, it's a single unit, and then we put those together to make nucleotides. Another example of monomer is glucose, and the polymer for that is, um, there's one of the polymers for that is, glu uh, is glycogen, which is links of glucose stacked together. So the importance of DNA is that it is a code that um, tells our body what we can make. Um, different things can be made though. So the making going from um, DNA to RNA, it's part of the central dogma, that is called transcription. So we're going from this coding, this just sequence of DNA, the two strands of coding and template. I hope you should remember that, but I'm not gonna test you on that in terms of um, gene ex the, the mechanisms of um, RNA transcription or DNA replication. So RNA is made from DNA and then a protein, a polypeptide, polypeptide, multiple peptides, um, so again, that's a polymer of peptides. Um, amino acids are single um, units of our protein. Individual amino acids are grouped together to form a polypeptide. And this is um, called translation when that happens. So because we're going from um, an old language of nucleotides to the actual amino acids, just different language. Um, and this amino acid sequence is important because it's going to determine how the protein folds. It's going to determine, this primary structure is going to determine the secondary, tertiary, and potentially quaternary structure of the protein. The only reason that matters, important reason, is structure determines function. So how the protein folds is going to determine the function of that protein. So a brief review of protein structure. That primary structure that I just showed you that was translated from RNA, determined by our DNA code. This is the sequence of amino acids that compose the polypeptide chain. That's primary structure. Secondary structure are alpha helices and beta sheets that are um, hydrogen bonds that bring those together further. Tertiary structure is where we first can have some sort of function. Um, so it's a three-dimensional, we'll talk about shapes of proteins in a moment, either long stretches, globs, various very complex, very particular specific shapes that carry out some function. That's the tertiary structure. Um, structure. Um, you can see how specific this protein here is. Um, so this is a protein that transports the thyroid hormone thyroxine in the blood and this CSF. Um, so that's the function of that protein. It's, it has a certain conformation, a certain shape, that allows it to bind to thyroid hormone, and also um, allows it to travel throughout the bloodstream, NCSF. Quaternary structure is only occurs for some proteins. It's the binding of two or more polypeptide chains together, then carry out a function. So some proteins function in quaternary structure. Hemoglobin is one example. Um, so a protein is functional either in tertiary or quaternary structure. The important part of either one of those is that that structure then determines the function of the protein. And what happens if you have a mutation in the DNA is that's going to change the function of the protein. So an example of that um, could either be evolutionarily, the video we saw, the different beaks, Darwin's finches, 
Another example is a mutation a variation in humans, right? So sickle cell anemia actually has a benefit in terms of um, malaria um, prevention. Those individuals are not as predisposed to malaria. So this is a um, human variant that occurs. It also can cause problems though in people who have two sickle cell genes and um, that can cause a problem. So this is your normal DNA sequence here. A mutation is a single base, so a single nucleotide mutation that causes the RNA to be different, of course, causes a different amino acid to be coded. Now that's not always the case. Not all mutations cause a different amino acid to um, come in there to be translated. There's some redundancy in our code, but and not every amino acid change makes a big difference, but sometimes it does, and that's how evolution occurs. Um, in this case, these amino acids are very different. So we're gonna actually have a different folding of our hemoglobin protein. Hemoglobin is gonna fold into tertiary and then quaternary structure, actually these four subunits together. Um, when you have this mutation, those proteins come together differently. They have a different structure, and so they don't have the same function. They're clumped, and this results in sickle-shaped cells. So I know the label is just off here, normal red blood cell, sickle cell, um, because of that protein, different structure. This is one example, there's tons of different examples of how you, you and also another big important one is protein activation. So by binding a new molecule, a protein can change, be turned on or turned off, phosphorylation, um, removal of a phosphate group or addition, Binding of a signaling molecule is going to be huge. That's how um, that's how we see. It's how we do everything. Um, is changes in protein structure, which then changes function. So let's talk about some examples of proteins. Here are some various proteins. Um, I wanted to show them in terms of their real. Oh, we're auto playing here. Um, their real structures. So you can really get an idea of what a structure of a protein means. The only exception to that is this membrane protein here. This is just a big blob. That's not really the structure of it, um, but this is showing where a membrane protein is located in the membrane. So different proteins are present in different cell types as well. Um, and this is what makes those cell types have different functions. So there's fibrous proteins. Um, keratin and collagen are fibrous. Where might those be located? Well, well keratin is actually in your skin. Um, collagen is in your skin as well. Your hair contains fibrous proteins. Um, those are going to actually be long proteins. Um, elastin is another one that we'll talk about. There's globular proteins is the other big group. So fibrous and globular are the two main groups. Globular basically is tons then, um, but it can help to visualize these things to think about how can keratin be a protein just like hemoglobin, the very different structures. That's okay, they're both proteins. Proteins are very diverse. So globular proteins are especially diverse, um, more complex, complex structures typically. Um, they're more sensitive to like pH or temperature changes, which is important for their, their functions. There's enzymes. So enzymes, um, as you may remember, are catalysts of a reaction. So they facilitate chemical reactions, breaking down fats, making ATP, um, copying DNA, making RNA, all that stuff. Enzymes, tons of types. Um, there's transport. So membrane proteins, one type is transport. Um, moving things in and out of cells, moving things throughout the bloodstream. Hemoglobin would be transport of oxygen throughout the bloodstream, carbon dioxide as well. And communication is another one. Um, so messengers or receptors in the plasma membrane. Then there's also other ones. So there's antibodies that help fight infection. Um, there's contractile proteins. We'll see lots of different proteins in this class. They're one of my favorite things because they determine the cell's function. So let's review, oh, what happened to that? Okay, um, so just to kind of reiterate here, all of the cells in your body originated from one cell. So this post-fertilized -fertilized zygote um, contains the same DNA when it divides. Um, if you looked under a microscope though, all the cells would look different after they have specialized, different phenotypes. And this is because they have different proteins present in them. Um, both inside of them, so in their cytoplasm, as well as on the membrane. And that's what makes your cells function differently and then make up different tissues and organs and makes you so special. 
So different proteins is basically what differential gene expression means. Because gene expression is expression of your genes, expression into RNA, and then ultimately proteins. Um, RNA is important too, it has some functions, but proteins will be the main topic of this class. Um, differential gene expression means that different functions expressed um, and makes us all special. So here are the learning outcomes that I hope I've addressed in this lecture. Explain how genetically identical cells in the human body can be so different, some of the terms I used. Um, explain how changes in the cell's DNA can result in a change in function. And this is a way to review the levels of protein structure. And lastly, provide several examples of proteins with different functions. Um, there's, these are some general names I gave now. We're going to have a lot more proteins I expect you to learn throughout the semester. All right, please let me know what questions you have.